Hello everybody, in this video lecture we will cover physiology of the hearing and I will use PowerPoint to help myself. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a PowerPoint from your chapter 15 and we already covered the first part that was about the vision and uh, we're gonna start with this slide and we will talk about hearing and a little bit about equilibrium as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. <clears throat> so sound is a pressure disturbance produced by a vibrating object. So what is a sound is, it's alternating areas of high and low pressure. Sound can be only propagated through the media. Uh, in a vacuum, like in an open space, sound cannot propagate. So there, you know, outer space is actually very quiet. Um, so if you have vacuum, you cannot hear any sound. So sound needs some media. It can be air or it can be maybe some fluids, but <clears throat> that's, that's what it is, right? It's a mechanical way. So a sound wave moves outward in all direction and it can be illustrated by S-shaped curve. Um, so over here you can see when we produce sound waves, uh, we're vibrating the air particles, so that's air particles, and sound waves are moving in all directions. Now over here you can also see that that's a wave. This is the crest of, of the waves. And this distance between two crests is called um, wavelength, <clears throat> right over here. So, um, so when we're talking about sound waves, um, we need to mention frequency. Frequency is the number of waves that pass a given point in a given time. Right, so if you go back, if, and if let's say I take this point and I will count how many waves are moving through this point over let's say one second, that will be my frequency. And the more waves are moving in a given time, the higher frequency is. Um, another characteristic of sound waves is wavelengths. And this is distance between two consecutive crests. So go back again. And here's the wavelength. And again, it can be smaller or bigger, this distance. And amplitude is the height of the crests. Take it back over here. So that's going up. This will be the amplitude. Now, properties of sound. When we're talking about sound, we can um, describe pitch and loudness. And pitch is a perception of different frequencies. So pitch can be um, high pitch or low pitch, right? If, if I'm talking like this, or oh, I'm talking like this, right? That will be a different pitch, and pitch depends on the frequency of the sound waves. So the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. And normal range is from 20 to 20,000 hertz. Another characteristic of sound is loudness. Loudness. And a normal range from 0 to 120 decibels. Um, and this is um, subjective interpretation of sound intensity. And you know that's easy to understand. Is it if I'm talking um, softly or I'm talking very loud? Yeah, I tend to talk very loud. Uh, sorry for that. You can always turn down the volume if I'm talking too loud. <clears throat> so over here we can uh, compare the high frequency and low frequency, and high frequency will give you high pitch and low frequency will give you low pitch. So here shown in red, that's a high frequency, right? So, um, so here's my time in the seconds, and you can see it's like we have more waves uh, 
in this time period when we're talking about red waves, high frequency, and we have only one, two, three waves in this time period. So that's a low frequency or low pitch. And here's our loudness, right? And it will be either pressure is higher or higher amplitude or low amplitude. And then the sound is either loud or soft. Now, structure of the cochlea. So over here, you can see the um, <clears throat> inner ear, right? So that's the whole structure shown here in purple is the inner ear, and it's a glute vestibule over here, semicircular canals, and then cochlea. Um, I do have lecture on the anatomy of internal or inner ear. So please make sure you watch video about anatomy before you watch video about physiology. Okay, so how we transmit sound to the inner ear first, right? So here we have sound waves and a sound waves coming from um, outside, from exterior of your body. And then sound waves, they vibrate this tympanic membrane. And tympanic membrane separate your outer ear from your middle ear. So when we vibrating this membrane, it's going to vibrate these auditory ossicles. And this will um, amplify the pressure. So it will increase the pressure. So this vibration moving from malleus to incus and to stapes. Now, the stapes vibrating, they push against the oval window because remember that's an oval window and this is round window. So, when the stapes pushes um, oval window, um, we have vibration now in the perilip. So, this is cochlea, and in the cochlea, we have three parts, right? A scala vestibuli on the top. Scala uh, tympani on the bottom and scala media or cochlea duct inside. So in the scala vestibuli and scala tympani, we have fluid called perilip. In the scala um, media or cochlea duct, we also have fluid, but this fluid is called endolim. So now we vibrating this oval window and we moving, right? So that's the movement in this um, fluid, perilim, right? So now if, if we receive sounds with the frequencies below uh, hearing, then they actually moving all the way up to this structure, this like point over here called helicotrema. And if they move to the helicotrema and move around, we will not be able to hear this sound. But all the sounds that we can hear, they move right through the cochlear duct. And they can move here, or they can move here, or they can move even over there, or very tip of this um, cochlear duct. But they need to move through this cochlear duct, and they are gonna vibrate a special membrane inside the cochlear duct that's called, that, that is called basilar membrane. And then <laughs> extra energy, right? We need to um, uh, remove it, right? We cannot keep all this pressure here. So this uh, wave will move now backwards and um, um, will be, def um, well, how the, uh, yeah, so um, the extra energy will be, I, I don't know, ever. <laughs> sorry for that, but through the round window, um, we get rid of this uh, extra energy of the vibration. Um, hope it makes sense, right? So the whole point for us, what is the point? Point from us to take this vibration, sound a wave vibration, vibrate all these structures, right? Like tympanic membrane, ossicles, vibrate perilymph, and vibrate basal membrane. And get rid of all this extra energy 
through the round window. Right? <clears throat> Um, so here you can see um, the uh, sound of the different frequencies. So if we have high frequency sound, then we're going to vibrate basal membrane near to the base. Right? Because you see the frequency, if the frequency is very high, right? So we have many, many waves in a second. So it's going to vibrate it pretty quickly, the basal membrane. The medium frequency sound uh, will vibrate or displace this basal membrane near to the middle and low frequency sound close to the apex, right? So it depends where we vibrate this um, basal membrane, we can perceive the frequency of sound waves. Now, structure of the cochlea. Um, I want to remind you that all this inner ear um, includes bony part and then membranous part inside the bony part. So it will be like bony labyrinth. Then inside we will have membranous part. And inside this membranous part, we will have some sensory part, right? In the cochlea, uh, we have our um, cochlea duct, right? And we have scala vestibuli, scala tympani. Those are our membranous structure. And inside cochlea duct, we have a special structure called the uh, organ of corti. And this is our sensory part. And uh, here on the bottom, we have a basal membrane. This is a membrane that will be vibrating. So it goes up and down, up and down. And we have supporting cells. But some cells over here, this one and this one, those are sensory receptors and they are hair cells. So they have this hair called stereocilia. It's like little cilia, right? And um, when basal membrane moves up and down on the top of these hair cells, we have another membrane, tectorial membrane. And this is like soft uh, uh, gelatinous type membrane. And um, this Hair cells will bend, um, so um, they will um, they will bend either right or left, right? And bending of this uh, hair will uh, create, as you know, it's a sorry, my dog is barking. Um, so when um, Bending of these uh, hair cells will make some changes inside those cells, and we will talk about it, right? So, and this will um, start this electrical impulse, and this electrical impulse will travel through these fibers, right, to um, the brain. So you can uh, hear stuff. Okay. So cells of the spiral organ, uh, spiral organ is our organ of corti. So this is the spiral organ. So cells of the spiral organ, we have supporting cells and we have cochlea hair cells. And there is one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. Um, and um, what connected to these hair cells are actually fibers of the cochlea nerve, right? So let's go back. So those are fibers, right, of the cochlea nerve that um, synapse with those hair cells. Okay, so here we can see organ of corti magnified, right? So you can see basal membrane, you can see supporting cell, you can see this tutorial membrane. And um, here are the um, hair cells. And bending of these hair cells will have uh, chemical changes inside these cells, especially inner hair cells. Those are the major cells. And um, these chemical changes will lead to electrical changes. And then finally, electrical impulse that goes through the cochlear nerve to your brain. OK. So um, those hair cells are called stereocilia, 
and they uh, protrude into the end of lymph, and they are enmeshed in a gel-like tectorial membrane. So bending steroid cilia opens mechanically gated ion channels um, inside those hair cells, and what start moving inside is potassium and calcium. When potassium and calcium moves inside those hair cells, um, we create this electrical current. Uh, it's called graded potential, and hair cells release glutamate. And glutamate excites the cochlear nerve fibers, right? So let's look back over here. So when sound vibrate your, uh, vibrate, vibrating your basal membrane, right? So basal membrane is vibrating, goes up and down, up and down. Those hair cells are bending. When they're bending, the special channels, potassium and calcium channels open. So potassium, calcium start moving inside those cells. And um, potassium and calcium, they're positively charged. So cells became positively charged inside, right? When it became positively charged inside, that, that excites the cell. And these cells start releasing neurotransmitter glutamate over here, right? Because that's, there, there is no direct connection here. There is a synapse, like a gap over here. So glutamate is released and glutamate excites those fibers of the cochlear nerve. <clears throat> Now, what happened uh, happen next? So impulses from the cochlea then passes to the medulla. Um, in the medulla, we have cochlear nuclei. And so it's a special area in the medulla. Uh, and um, uh, from there, from the medulla, they can go e either into um, uh, superior olivary nucleus or inferior um, colliculus, right? So that's that's the part of the uh, auditory reflexes. Um, but um, because we again we didn't cover any nervous system, let's just remember that from the cochlear nerve, this impulse goes to the part of the brain, right? The called medulla, and then to the thalamus, and thalamus receives all your sensory information uh, and um, right so and then from salamos it goes to your auditory cortex of the brain um, and of course to um, really understand where the sound is coming from you need to input from both ears Okay, so here that's the diagram that shows us. So that's a cochlear duct, right? Inside the cochlear duct, we have a sensory organ, spiral organ or organ of 40. And over here, we have this hair cells. Um, so when we have a bending of the hair cells, um, bending of the hair on the hair cells, those hair cells release glutamate, that is neurotransmitter, that excite those neurons, right? So that's neurons carry now this action potential all the way over here to the medulla, right? So here are our cochlear nuclei. So it's just a special area where cell bodies are located. So it goes to the medulla and from medulla it's moving up. Um, because medulla is the in most inferior part of your brain stem. So from medulla, it's moving up, 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 and it gets to this thalamus. A special is medial um, geniculate nuclei, right? So over here. And from, uh, from the thalamus, it moves to your primary auditory cortex that's located in your temporal lobe, just deep to your temporal bone. And now this electrical impulse excites neurons in your cortex, and you can um, have this sensation of hearing. <clears throat> so uh, impulses from specific hair cells are interpreted as specific pitches. Loudness is detected by increasing number of action potential. Then result when the hair cells um, experience larger deflection, 
and localization of sound depends on the uh, intensity and timing of sound waves uh, reaching both ears. Um, so now, if something goes wrong from this process of a transformation of sound energy into electrical energy and finally excitation of your neuron in a temporal lobe, person can be deaf. So we have two major types of deafness, conduction deafness and sensorineural deafness. So conductance deafness when sound never reaches the fluids in the internal ear. Those perilymph in a um, scala vestibular, right? Um, so when when there is no <laughs> uh, there is no when those fluids in a scala vestibular does not receive the sound, then it will be conduction deafness, and that can be result from um, impact earwax, perforated um, eardrum, or um, Autosclerosis of the ossicles. Uh, sensory neural deafness, when we have damage in a, any neural structure at any point from the cochlear hair cells to the auditory cochlear cells. So let's just go back over here. And um, so oh, let, me, let me just um, exit this part. So where we, where we, we're at, so I just want to remind you what we're talking about. So we're talking about conduction, uh, conduction deafness and sensory neural deafness. And here's a picture that I want to show you. So um, right here. So if we have any damage in the outer ear or middle ear, so this wave, sound wave, never reaches this fluid, right? This perilymph of the scala vestibuli, then this will be conduction deafness. Now, when we um, moving here, from here, right here. So now, if we have any damage starting with the hair cells, right, or these fibers, or that fibers, or here, so anywhere from these hair cells all the way to this primary auditory cortex, then this will be a sensory neural deafness. Sensory neural deafness. Right? Okay. So let's continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, tinnitus. Tinnitus is a ringing or clicking sound in the ear in the absence of auditory stimuli. And this is, can be due to cochlear nerve degeneration, inflammation of middle or internal ears, or it can be also a side effect of aspirin. Um, Minier syndrome. Uh, Minier syndrome is a disorder that affect cochlea and semicircular canals, and it causes vertigo, nausea, nausea, and vomiting. Okay, so that was about sound. Now we will briefly talk about equilibrium and orientation. So um, this is the structure, right? That's our cochlea. That's a cochlea uh, oval window, right? Then uh, here's a round window, and that's a cochlea. And this part is responsible in hearing. Now, the part of the inner ear that's important for equilibrium and balance and orientation will be uh, this green part that's called vestibule, and this blue part that is called semicircular canals. Um, so also, um, I'm reminding you that I do have video on anatomy of uh, inner ear. And so make sure you watch that video. Now, vestibular apparatus consists of the equilibrium receptors um, in a semicircular canal and vestibule. So that's green and blue together called vestibular apparatus. And it's made of vestibule and semicircular canals. Um, now, in the vestibule, we have receptors for static equilibrium. 
and in the semicircular canals, we have receptors for dynamic equilibrium. So, in uh, so let's say if you if you're moving forward, if you're moving backwards, right? If you you kind of like just walking back and forth, or you in a um, let's say um, elevator, and elevator goes up and down. So that's your linear acceleration. You can feel this movement. Also, if if you upside down, if you standing on your head, you know where your gravity is. So that's also because of vestibule. Now, when you rotate your head, when you're doing this medial lateral rotation, now, or you're spinning your whole body, um, or somebody's uh, spinning you, um, you feel this movement because of these semicircular canals. Now, um, so again, um, the same as for cochlea, we have um, vestibule and semicircular canals. Those are bony structures. Inside those bony structures, we have membranous structure. And inside the membranous structure, we have sensory structure. Now, in a vestibule, we have mac utricle and macula. So utricle would be right here close to these canals. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, utricle and saccule. So that will be utricle, and saccule will be here close to the cochlea. So utricle and saccule, those are membranous structure. And inside this membranous structure, we have sensory structures that are called macula. And macula just means a spot. So here's how macula look like. And remember, macula is sensory structure. Utricle and saccule are membranous structure. Vestibule is bony structure. Now, a macula, we have, again, hair cells and supporting cells. And we also have this gelatinous matrix, and we have a special uh, chemical here, like a crystals, called otolith. So here's the otolith. Now, in this hair, uh, hair cells, um, so, um, okay, I, I'll, I'll get back to it, but right, so look, that's our hair cells. This is supporting cells. Those are neurons, sensory neurons, shown here in yellow. Now, in a semicircular canals, and we have anterior, posterior, and um, and what medial, right canal, oh, and lateral, anterior, posterior, and lateral semicircular canals. Inside those canals, we have a structure that called ampulla. So like this um, structure over here, that's the ampulla. This is the ampulla. Um, so inside this ampulla, we have um, structures that's called cupula, right? So um, uh, cube and crista too, okay. So the ampulla is just um, like a wider part, like that's the ampulla. And crista is our sensory structure. So here's the crista. Um, so in the crista, so that's, that's the crista. Also, you can see the hair cells, right? So here's the hair cells, and here's our sensory neurons. Here's supporting cells. And we have a gelatinous matrix over here. We have cupula here, right? So that's a cupula. Uh, it will make a little bit more sense in a second. Um, let's move here. So where are we at? We are inside utricle or saccule. Utricle and saccule are inside the vestibule. And here we have macula. So here's your macula, and here's the hair cells, and here's the um, nerve fibers. And on the top, we have the membrane, um, like gelatinous membrane, and we have this otolith over here. Now, this cilia, um, it's called stereocilia, the same as in the hair cells in your um, retina. But they also have this, like a bigger cilium, and it's called um, kinocilia. Right, so it, I think that's, um, that's what it says. So um, macula is for static equilibrium. We have one in each saccule wall and one in each utricle wall. And this monitor your position of a head in the space, necessary for posture control. 
uh, and it's responsible for linear acceleration forces. So you can feel this linear acceleration, but not rotation. And macula contains supporting cells and the hair cells. And hair cells, they have stereocilia and kinocilia. And those stereocilia and kinocilia, they are embedded in a membrane started with otoliths. And otoliths are tiny stones, it's calcium carbonate. Right, so here what we have, right, this yellow, that's our macula. Now, um, so when you do not move, when you do not move, right, look, um, this stereocilia is kind of like pointing straight, and it's actually, so here, here how it looks when you do not move. And actually this stereocilia, it's always secrete um, neurotransmitter. So it always activates your uh, sensory fibers. And here's your action potential, right? So you have like impulse, like very specific frequency of this impulse. Now, when, um, when you move, um, you're not rotating, but you can just, you know, bend your head. Um, this stereocilia, it's also um, is bending towards or away from kinocilium. So when it works towards this kinocilium, we increase the frequency of the action potential. So it's kind of like electrical impulse uh, increases, the frequency increases. When you bend it, your head in another direction, right, uh, away from this kinocilium, then we decrease the action potential frequency. And that's how your brain understand that you are moving or you accelerating uh, a linear, uh, uh, you have linear accelerating of your body or you just, um, you know, you know where your head is, right? Uh, uh, do you, um, you know, bend it over? Do you flex your neck? Do you extend, hyperextend your neck, right? So, or oh, you're moving left, right, backwards, forwards, and that's how your brain understands that you are moving because either those sensory neurons <clears throat> sending high frequency electrical signal to your brain or low frequency electrical signal to your brain. Uh, now for dynamic equilibrium, we using um, crista inside ampulla and ampulla inside this semicircular canal. Okay, so let's look over here. So here's our, um, yes, okay, so we do have lateral. So we have anterior, posterior, and lateral uh, semicircular canals. Um, so here we have ampulla, and inside the ampulla we have crista. And in the crista, we also have hair cells, right, with the stereocilia, uh, and um, we have this gelatinous membrane called cupula and sensory nerve fibers synapsing with these hair cells. Um, we also have um, kina cilia, like a long cilia over here. Now, um, look what happened. When you start rotating um, this fluid, uh, inside these semicircular canals are moving and it's um, disturbing this cupula and cupula cause bending of the hair cells, hair on the hair cells, this stereocilia. So let's look here. So um, this is when you do not move, this is when you start your rotational movement and um, this stereocilia now bending um, right over here and here when you stop moving and you know but uh, fluid continue to move so you either again um, there is a bending um, of this stereocilia towards the kinocilium or away from kinocilium and um, it's also um, either increase the frequency or decrease the frequency of action potential Right? And this is how your brain, again, understand that uh, you have this rotational movement. Okay, so now equilibrium pathway to the brain. 
is really very complex and poorly traced. But what we know for sure is that we send these um, signals from your vestibular apparatus to the cerebellum, uh, to the brain, uh, to the, uh, of course, uh, thalamus. Um, and different parts of the brain are responsible to, uh, for sensing your movement. And plus, um, for you to keep your balance, for you to walk, to be oriented in a space, those are actually very, very hard tasks that we need to do, or your brain needs to do. But for you to keep your balance or orientation, you cannot rely only on your vestibular apparatus. You also need to receive signals from your visual receptors and from the somatic receptors. Specifically, those receptors are in, the, um, in your muscles. Um, so over here pretty much tells you, well, how to keep my equilibrium, how to keep my balance. You need signal from your vestibular uh, receptors, right? And from, you know, this uh, crista and macula, you need to receive signals from your eyes, your visual receptors, and you need to say, uh, receive signals from your skeletal muscles and joints. And um, only, by interpreting all this information, you can, um, you can control your neck movement and eye movement, right? And this allow you to uh, proper move your body, your limb, your trunk, your neck. Um, so pretty much for you to move, especially um, the walking, right? you need to receive all this information from, um, uh, from all these receptors. And very quickly, development aspect. However, here we only have development aspect of the vision. Vision is not fully functional in birth, and um, babies are hyperopic. Mm, they see only gray tones, uh, eye movement are uncoordinated, and uh, by age of five, we only learn how to um, really perceive, uh, get this precipitation of color, vision and um, fully developed eyes, emetropic eyes um, by age of six. And with age, we're losing our vision. The lens became um, cloudy, they lose their clarity, uh, dilator muscles are less efficient and visual acuity is drastically decreased by age of 70. So we born with a poor vision, right? And when we get older, our vision became uh, worse. When we're talking about hearing, actually you born with very, very good developed sense of hearing. Actually, you never, you will never hear as well as when you were a baby. And then of course the hearing also declines with the age. Okay, well, I, I think that's it. Yes, this is was, I'm sorry. And sometimes I get like uh, a little bit nervous uh, when I'm recording those videos. It's something really new for me. So I apologize if, if something maybe I do not pronounce clear enough. Uh, but the good thing is that there are so many videos of great instructors on YouTube. You guys can always find better videos, but I promise you, I'm trying to do my best. Um, okay, but anyway, that's it for chapter 15, Special Senses. Thank you for watching, and I hope it was helpful.